I'm Mimi, I'm going to talk about fish, which um, you would more commonly see in an aquarium or on your plate. Um, so I've been looking at um, tunas, which is um, a group of fish that are very economically important um, and also ecologically important. Um, and recent molecular studies have discovered that um, these are actually related to a really wide range of other fish um, that are very uh, morphologically disparate. So they um, looked. Pardon. Oh, sorry. Um, so they look very different to one another, um, and you have some really deep-bodied forms um, that. Um, so you have deep-bodied forms like Caristids and Brahmids, um, and you also have um, these really weird deep-sea swallowers. Um, this one has swallowed a Trichurid, which is also part of this group. Um, so they're found in a really um, wide range. Um, of ecological niches. Um, so this group is made up of 15 families. Um, this is edited from um, the MIA paper, which is a paper that I'll come back to later on in the talk. Um, and there are 83 genera and 229 species. Um, and there's also um, another family, a monotypic family, that might be a member of this group. Um, so the reason they're a bit unusual is that they're all found, they're united by a pelagic ecology, hence pelagia. Um, and we think that from molecular work that we're doing um, at the same time as this project, um, we think that they are related um, and actually diversified very fast um, at the beginning um, of the paleogene. So this is work that's been done um, by Rich Harrington um, and we're hoping we'll come out soon. Um, but for the rest of this talk, I'm going to use that MIA um, paper as the basis for my phylogenetic tree. Um, so why are we interested in terms of um, this group? So adaptive radiations in the modern are sort of discussed about like cichlids or anolis lizards. And these are um, nice in that they are very small scale. Um, but that's also their problem. So they tend to be restricted, so either to um, African rift lakes or to islands. And actually, if you look at adaptive radiations as they were originally defined, um, you have mammals, which are widely distributed on a large temporal and spatial scale. So um, Pelagia actually um, make a nice um, study system because they are also quite old. They're the same age as um, placental mammals, roughly. Um, and um, they have a really good um, fossil record. So um, we have some two-dimensional data, um, so flatfish, basically, but we also have this really nice three-dimensional data um, from London Clay and also from Angola and some other places around the world. Um, and we have a really good fossil record, particularly for tuners, um, but also for some of the other groups. Um, so this is sort of where I'm leading to, is using these fossils. Um, so I have been CT scanning extant fish, so um, living fish, um, to create a morphospace to look at the fossils eventually. Um, so we've scanned all of the families. Um, we've scanned 73 of 230 species, so just over a quarter. Um, and um, I have been landmarking all of these um, specimens. So I've got CT scans of them. I've put landmarks on them. Um, and then I've put these into a morphospace. So these, um, this is the result. So on PC1, we seem to have um, elongation of the skull, but also depth. So they seem to be sort of correlated with each other. Um, and on PC2, we seem to be related to jaw joint. Um, so you have um, a posterior jaw joint um, and then an anterior jaw joint underneath the eye. And what you're getting is, so we've got a group here. This is the trichuris and the gempylids. Um, these are the chiasmodontids, which are a bit weird. Um, they're a bit like snakes, so they have highly modified um, skull shapes. Um, and then you have brahmids and Christians over here. Um, and in the center here, you have the relatively normal tuners, um, which look kind of like a fish in terms of their um, skull morphology. So this is nice because um, I've also done this with two-dimensional data, um, and you get basically the same pattern. So you have long, skinny trichurids, which have an elongate skull, falling out in the same place in the morphospace. You have these deep-bodied um, forms on this side, and the tuners are coming out basically in the middle. The only thing that changes is the chiasmodontids move down to here, 
And that's because actually if you look at them when they haven't swallowed a fish, they look pretty normal. They look kind of like a fish. Um, so they move down into sort of the center of the morphospace. Um, so how does this help us look at adaptive radiations? Um, so the first thing that I did after this was um, I was doing a disparity through time analysis. So this isn't a disparity through time analysis like um, you would perhaps be used to with fossils. So it's not a sample diversity, an observation that you see in the fossil record. This is a simulated um, disparity based on the tree. So it takes a slice through the tree and looks at that point in time and um, looks at the disparity between the different um, branches on that tree. So under Brownian motion, you'd expect this sort of straight line down to zero. Um, and under a, an early burst model where you have an adaptive radiation, you would expect it to drop at the beginning. And this is because um, you're developing um, lots of different um, morphologies quite fast. Um, so I'll discuss that a bit more relating to my results. So on here, this is the simulated um, Brownian motion disparity. So if it was Brownian motion, it would follow within this line here. And this is the um, median point. Um, and that is the KPG. Um, and this is the results. So for my tree, for my data, um, you have this really big drop. And then this sits underneath the Brownian motion, um, what you would expect. So it's showing quite a clear adaptive radiation sort of pattern. And this is because quite early on in the history of the clade, you have a lot of disparity between clades. So things develop into long skinny things and deep bodied skin things very early. And then they sort of continue on like that until the modern. Um, and this is, so this is for the skull shape. Um, and you also see the same pattern ooh, it won't change, um, in two dimensional things. So this is for um, whole body shape. And again, you have slightly less um, marked, but still there. Um, it drops very early. So this is really nice because it mirrors a pattern that we see in fossils. So um, this is, um, I think it's attributed to bromoides. It's a bit of a, we'll discuss that. It's another part of my PhD. Um, this is um, assigned to gastroechisma. Um, and they look really similar. And there's a lot of these forms that look like this from the Eocene. And again, the same is seen in two-dimensional fossils. So you have um, tuners that look kind of like tuners. So the fossil record seems to be backing up these simulated um, results. So this is really nice. Um, and it's something that I kind of want to incorporate. So I have all of these really nice um, three-dimensional skulls that I've segmented. and. Um, the next sort of project for this is to landmark these as well and put them into the data set um, and see what happens. Um, so this is who I would like to thank. Thank you for listening. <laughs>